Now this brings me to a great point, which is pesticides. And now I greatly encourage you all to start looking at pesticides as a last resort, not as a first choice. Because the vast majority of times, either through cultural, mechanical, or other methods, you can find a solution that's much more sustainable to yourself and the environment than anything you'd find at the bottom of a bottle. Now, unfortunately, studies are coming out almost weekly showing the deleterious effects that even seemingly benign pesticides like herbicides and fungicides are having on our pollinators, especially bees. Sometimes, for example, these bees come into contact with pesticides that don't outright kill them. That's known as a sublethal exposure. What happens then is those chemicals are incorporated inside the bee. Sometimes the bee's fine, but sometimes those chemicals actually interact with other pesticides or other chemicals that that bee comes into contact out in the field. Those chemicals can actually transform into more powerful and harmful chemicals and even those sublethal exposures can end up damaging the brains of these bees to the extent that they forget skills that they've learned throughout their lives. It changes the ways they act if they're a social species, and sometimes it inhibits their ability to fly completely. And now, another thing to keep in mind is a lot of herbicides, especially Roundup, of which the active ingredient is glyphosate. A lot of those herbicides kind of inhibit a very specific pathway that both plants and fungi use to kind of live their lives. Now this is having far-reaching effects, especially in the soil, which is made up of a huge diversity of microfauna, both bacteria and fungi. Those microbes are the real heavy movers when it comes to transforming atmospheric nitrogen and other uh, elements into usable forms for plants. Unfortunately, studies are finding that this glyphosate heavily disrupts those microbial, especially fungi networks, but those networks aren't only in the soil. They're also in the guts of both ourselves and a lot of these, these pollinators. And unfortunately, these sublethal exposures to, you know, again, seemingly benign herbicides and fungicides are heavily disrupting those gut microbiota and are making it more difficult for these animals to defend themselves, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, basically um, kind of systemic responses to diseases, uh, and it also just hampers their ability to synthesize the foods that they eat. It basically just makes it harder for them to live. And so there is a time and a place for pesticide use, but for the vast majority of times, especially for an average homeowner, there's a better way and a more sustainable way than just relying on the, the spray and pray, basically. And by following basically all of the tenants that I've talked to you today, which is basically restoring bare, disturbed areas to kind of diverse areas of native plantings, you can turn a sterile, somewhat lifeless space like this into a thriving wildlife oasis that is bustling with life, even just one season following. And so as you're engineering a space with a high diversity of plants, a high diversity of flower shapes, sizes and colors. Also, try to leave the areas to the periphery, again, wild when you can. Let the native plants that have been biding their time in the seed bank come up. Free those spaces of any invasive incursions and let dead standing wood accumulate where it stays or falls. Another very important thing is to leave leaf litter whenever possible. Like we went over earlier, bumblebee queens, some wasp queens, and even some adult butterflies really love to take shelter in leaf litter. And so by leaving even just a few inches, again, even in a very manicured space, maybe in the periphery of your garden, you can really uh, go a long way to give these animals shelter in the wintertime. Now, one note on those leaf piles, there was just a study done last year that showed that ticks really love to reproduce in leaf piles right at a woodland edge. And so I encourage you, if you live kind of right at the margin of a forest, either have your leaf piles pushed into the forest or have them brought closer to your space, but try to avoid keeping them kind of right at that woodland margin. And yeah, I mean, we can just go one more. I think there was, this is just a great example of, again, the wide diversity of flower types and shapes and just kind of different textures that you'll want throughout a garden. 
And basically the idea for many native spaces is this won't happen overnight, but a lot of our native plants grow really well with and among each other. Some of our native plants actually prefer to have kind of a shoulder to lean on as they're growing. And so the basic idea for a, a kind of a long-term pollinator garden is to plant the space with a wide diversity of native plants, see what native plants come up on their own, and let the space go. Kind of let it get as crowded as it'll be, and then maybe at the end of the season, late fall, early spring, cut down any pithy stems to kind of, um, kind of remove their unsightly nature. But as you're trimming those hollow or pithy stems, try to leave them at about a, a foot high if you can to, again, give some stem nesting bees, like small carpenter bees, a place to settle down even as you're cleaning up your space. <clears throat> Another really important thing to keep in mind is cultivars or cultivated varieties of plants. And now, not all plants are created equal, unfortunately, and this even goes for native plants. And now, as humans have dealt with plants and have grown plants and have perhaps more importantly sold plants in the landscape trade, there have been a lot of varieties that have been cultivated by man to perform different things. And some cultivars are, are pretty benign and, and pretty good for the environment. So there are some varieties that are disease resistant or drought resistant, for example. And they might you know, go in very specific areas where the same species might not survive. But there are some cultivars that you really want to be aware of when you're planning your space. Now, one of the most important cultivars to look out for and to kind of have a red flag for is any cultivar that changes the foliage color of the plant to any large degree. And so, Heuchera is a great example of this. There's a ton of different cultivars that have basically every color under the rainbow. And really, these colors are mostly given to the plant through the different phytochemicals or chemicals that are coursing through the plant itself. And a lot of these changes to the foliage color just means that there are different or altered chemicals that are coursing through those leaves. And by changing those chemicals, Unfortunately, some of our native animals, especially pollinators and other insects, might not have developed the capacity to deal with those unique chemicals quite yet. And so planting uh, a plant that has a heavily altered foliage color, you might actually be downright harming the plants or the animals you're trying to save. And so if it's a cultivar that heavily alters the foliage color to any large degree, I would just drop it like it's hot. Now, the other cultivar to avoid is double blooms or any other cultivar that heavily alters the flower shape or the bloom to any large degree. And now, as double bloom cultivars really look attractive to our eyes, it almost looks like they're bursting with petals. This unfortunately comes at quite the cost. These double blooms are actually due to a mutation in the sexual organs of the plant itself that has turned them into more petals. And so what it does is it looks great to our eyes, but these you know, huge profusion of, of petals serves to either make it very difficult for pollinators to get into the flower itself, or sometimes in some more pronounced cultivars, there aren't even any like, sexual organs in the flower at all. And so it ends up being a huge waste of time and energy for any pollinators that are trying to make their way in. And so, for those two reasons, have a red flag or heavily disregard any cultivars that alter the foliage color to any large degree or that alter the bloom type to any large degree. Again, most of the other cultivars are relatively benign. A lot of them have you know, traits that will help them survive in an area. But if you're in a nursery and you're not sure if this is a cultivar or what exactly it is, just act, ask the workers there. Chances are they're a plant nerd who will love to talk your ear off, and you can find out a little bit more about what exactly that, might, that cultivar might be attempting to do. Now, here are just another kind of uh, group of really important native plants. And one of the often overlooked plants when someone's planning a space for pollinators are trees. Trees are, of course, humongous plants, so they have a huge amount of blooms in them. But also a lot of our trees here especially are very early bloomers. And so they're very, very important pollinator plants, again, especially very early in the season for some of our bees like bumblebees and carpenter bees that are out very early in the season. These uh, tulip poplars are also very important host plants for a wide diversity of 
butterflies, and moths. And so by planting a wide diversity of plants, you're just catering to the widest diversity of animals in your space. And so the first thing I encourage you to do, if you've got a space that you're thinking of catering to plant, uh, pollinators with, first take a walk through your area. See in your neighborhood. Maybe are there a lot of trees? Are there not many trees? Try to determine when the plants in your area are in bloom and try to plan your space to have plants that bloom in the times where there's a dearth of flowers in your area, to kind of fill those gaps in pollinator time uh, in the kind of landscapes around you. Many of our native bees, especially these wood nesting bees, are only able to forage about 200 yards from their nest. So they need food, shelter, and a source of water all within those 200 yards to really settle down for the long term. So again, try to take a first look at the kind of the landscapes that are already in place and try to use your space to kind of bolster and maybe fill any bloom gaps that are kind of in your area. And here's just another great example of one of our native plants that is a pretty neat adaptation. These, of course, some of them do have uh, poisons coursing through their nectar, but also mountain laurels, their kind of reproductive structures are actually spring-loaded. And so uh, basically what happens is when a bee or other pollinator lands on the flower, all of these uh, kind of structures that are held off to the side spring onto the bee and kind of puff like a, a huge cloud of pollen up. So it's almost like a, a floral bear trap, if you will. And so just by looking at mountain laurels in your area, you can see which ones have been sprung and which ones are still kind of waiting uh, to spring on an unsuspecting pollinator. And so you can get a quick, easy glance at how well your mountain laurels have been pollinated this year. And you know, our native bees are much tougher than, say, uh, you know, some other exotic bees. They really don't mind being kind of slapped in the body by this mountain laurel. And actually, there's a native alfalfa bee here in the States that only pollinates alfalfa. And alfalfa has a very similar structure on it. It actually just has one little spring-loaded um, structure that serves to slap the pollinator right in the face. And interestingly enough, those alfalfa bees are some of the only pollinators that can, get, that can take it and ask for more, basically. And so they're really the, the most important pollinators of those alfalfa plants, uh, just because of that adaptation.